Okay, module five uh, will be um, also talking about variant coding, but another type of variant coding, which is a structural variant coding, which I have to say as uh, my preference. It's more harder, it's more complicated, it's more wider in terms of what they are cover, but uh, it's more challenging, but I, I, it's, I, prefer, I pre prefer it. Um, so in that lecture, I will try to make you understand what are structural variants first, uh, and how we can uh, discover them using uh, NGS data. And to that, the different strategy you can have, what are strong and what are weakness, and uh, a bit of how we can see this variant in IGV. So uh, what are the structural variants? Uh, it's genomic rearrangements that are, so usually more than 50 base pair long for, in, for indels. Um, so, and it could be so deletion, uh, ins insertion, inversion, uh, mo mobile element uh, um, uh, modification, duplication, or translocation. <clears throat> so, just to give you uh, the details, uh, at the beginning, since recently, uh, structural variants, and especially copy number vari vari variation, were detected like that. So, by fish approach, karyotyping, so it was not really evident. Also, a bit of um, some array. So, it was not really uh, an efficient way and a good resolution uh, way to detect uh, structural variants. So it's where uh, the uh, next generation sequencing has really been a game changer for that uh, type of, um, of, of variant. So just to give you uh, an uh, idea of what the impact of structural variant, uh, a lot of people that are looking at structural variants are most of the time working in cancer because in cancer, uh, they are a strong, strong impact of a structural variant and then copy number. So this is a, uh, an example of a karyotype of a cancer patient, and you can see that uh, chromosomes are totally break out, re reassembled, and duplicated or deleted, and it's a, it's a big mess. So it's uh, really interesting to, uh, to study structural variants when you, when you are working on a um, cancer project. So the, the class of structural variants so we have the copy number variants, so the CNVs, so deletion and duplication, so it's a large uh, segment of the, the genome. We have the copy neutral rearrangement, inversion, translocation, and the other type of uh, structural variants, so insertion of new sequence, like a virus or whatever, and the mobile element uh, impact. So this is the same uh, classification of uh, structural variants, but uh, with the, what they represent is what they represent in terms of uh, genomic structure. So, what is really important to understand when you study structural variants is uh, when we talk about structural variants, we talk about what we see in the sample when we compare to the reference. I mean, here we see a de uh, we see a deletion. But in fact, in the, in, there's no deletion in the sample. The sample has his DNA like that. He has his deleted. It's deleted when you compare to the reference. So the reference has something more. When, you, when we have a, an insertion, it's, we have something more than that we have in the, in the reference. So think about that. It's always, uh, it's always referred to the reference genomes. So here you've got the insertion of genomic sequence or mobile element. Uh, tandem duplication or inspired duplication, inversion, or translocation. So as I say, NGS was a game changer for that kind of uh, analysis. So we did karyotyping, then we did fish, then we do um, uh, for, ex ex for the for the CNV we do then uh, CGH array, then we did a sleep array, and now we are working with. Um, I throughput uh, sequencing. Just to give you an idea of what type of uh, information we have when we detect uh, CNVs, uh, so CGS array, you just look what the amount of 
DNA you've got at each position. When you look at uh, SNP array, you take the same information, but you also look at the analog frequency. NGS uh, try to, a lot of methods for NGS are similar to what they done in um, CGS array, because you look at the read distribution for copy, but we now try to develop methods that are uh, uh, that doing a mimic of what we have in the SNP array. So when we detect method in NGS data, uh, we can detect we can detect almost every type of uh, variant. So the point mutation, as we did previously, but the indels, the copy number, or the other type of the other type of um, of uh, structural variant. So what are the tr strategy we use to do uh, structural variant detection? So there are um, four major uh, strategy. So the read pair strategy, I will, I will go in detail of each uh, method after that, but the read pair is to look at how you read maps uh, between the two pair of your, of your reads. The read depth, accumulation of reads. Split reads, how, if you have a breakpoint, how this will impact the in internal sequence of a read. So read pair is really the two pair and one of the others. The split read is inside a, 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 a same read. Or, and you have a separate uh, method, which is the assembly. So read pair, how it works. So the idea of the read pair, you identify the uh, breakpoint of your structural variant by looking at your alignment between your two reads. So when you've done your sequencing library, you have created your library with a specific uh, fragment site. You know you are around uh, 400 base pair, for example. And if you span a variant, you expect that either your read will be if you will be too close or too large based on what you have uh, sequenced. So the idea is to look at this variation of the insert size to uh, determine the structural variant. Uh, the main limitation of that is the sensitivity. And the sensitivity is based on the, uh, how you uh, do your uh, size selection. If you have, uh, so how you do size selection, I mean, what the um, standard deviation and the size of your of your read and your insert size. So, when you do your uh, uh, when you look at your insert size, you look at the distance in your in your the, the distance of your of your fragment, the size of your initial fragment. The size is supposed to be there, and you look after mapping. So you've got this uh, kind of. Um, uh, Gaussian distribution around the mean of your insert size, what you are supposed to, to have uh, selected. And you take your distribution. So if you have the, la the wider uh, structural uh, standard deviation, the wider your, your distribution will be like that. Okay? So it's really important to have a, a, a tiny uh, distribution. So what you will see, you will say, okay, I've got my distribution of my, of my read. No, I think that, for example, uh, Two standard deviation will be my concordant uh, distribution, my blue distribution, and everything that is out of that, the two tail will be my discordant uh, reads. So what what I do for that? I take this discordant read and then look where they are in the genome, and I try to find cluster of reads that are discordant and that are, that are clustered at the same location, and that give me uh, several evidence of the same discordance. And then I will call my uh, structural variant. So I, how it works, if you have a coconut of trees, you've got your um, sample genome here. You've got your reference genome. So you expect to see in your initial fragment the same distance in your, um, that what you have in your reference. Now, if I have a deletion, so if I lose part of the reference uh, genome, my fragment is always the same. It's always the same time because I select my size. size. But when I map it, as I lose a fragment from the reference, my, map, my two read will map really uh, with a large insert size. Same for um, um, an insertion. 
So I've got my fragment which is the same size, but I've got a fragment that is not in the in the um, in the reference. So we see the fragment that will be uh, map uh, too close. So we can do it really uh, easy for uh, insertion deletion. Insertion is a bit more tricky because due to the size of your reads, usually you have a, a really low resolution and it's hard to do insertion. It's, it's better for, for looking at deletion. It's easier. Because here you are limited by the size of your fragment. So if the deletion is too big, you, cannot, you will not be able to map your read on, onto the genome. So now if you have uh, uh, a tandem duplication, what you will see, you will have so two copies in your uh, sample, and you will have a fragment that will go over the two copies of your, of your fragment. And you, what you will see, you will see this uh, paired, this fragment that go over the two copies, the read, the, 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 their pair, will match in a larger way, but at the opposite, at the opposite direction. So you will have normal read there, because you have normal fragment here. You will have normal fragment here, but you will have some of them that just pop up and tell you you have um, you have the tandem duplication. Inversion will be quite a similar pattern as this one. You will have read with larger uh, insert size, but only one of them will be inverted. But you will have you should expect to have a set of evidence here and a set of evidence between that one and this one. You will on, not only have one uh, breakpoint, but you will have the evidence for the two breakpoints. Now, if we uh, look at, uh, so tandem duplication is already done. Uh, inversion, yeah, inversion. So you have the second breakpoint here. Now, if you have a large insertion, it will be uh, more, uh, more complicated. Because if you have insertion from a other distance, you will have a signal that will be uh, not spread on the same genome, on the same region. So you will be, it will be hard to difference between a translocation and an insertion. So the way we do to detect that is we expect to see two sets of translocation that launch to the same uh, region and that's passed to other different, the two other locations. So this is how it works. So really simple, but uh, with the limitation of uh, the size of the reads, the limitation of the standard deviation of the of the of the size selection. So to do that, you have many uh, tools to do to do it, uh, like Breakdancer, one of the mm, uh, uh, first tools that have been uh, released, and a lot of the other tools. Uh, today we will use Daily to do that, which is a really great tool. You will understand what after that. Um, so just to tell you, when we detect structural variants, it's uh, in the population. When we do apply a method, so what we find, we find a lot of them. So the method to do that, the method to detect structural variants with a read pair are really efficient, but uh, they, are, they are, uh, also provide a lot of false positive. So you will need to do a lot of filtering of your, of your data. Another limitation with the read pair is when you have a complex region, like this one, uh, you don't know what you are. You just have evidence, crazy evidence of uh, many events, and you don't, cannot really make sense of what you have. So just to summarize uh, read pair, the, the weakness of the method is it's really uh, difficult to interpret when you have a kind of complex region, and which is most of the case in repetitive region. Uh, it's difficult to characterize a highly rearranged region, and you have a high trait of false positive. Uh, the, the strength is, in te theoretically, you can detect all types of SVs. The second approach we can use is a split tree. So um, the rationale of the split read is you take reads and you look at reads that have been break into pieces. 
and then you try to make sense of this uh, read. So you try to see read that break of the that break into few pieces, one two pieces, and see how they map together. And you try to find cluster of evidence that show you the same pattern, and you can call uh, the, va the the variation. One of the major advantages here is you are really looking at the breakpoint, so you are really precise. And one of people that uh, working with uh, split read really recommend to do uh, longer reads, uh, to do to do to access the longer read because you have more chance to uh, split your reads. Because if you split your reads at the one end of your reads, if you don't have enough uh, enough reads in one of the parts, you won't be able to map it. So you will just cut your read and don't know where the other part of the read will map. So the longer you read, the better uh, the, the efficiency of the speech read method will, will be. So how it works, uh, you take your read, you align. Uh, most of the pair align correctly, but some of them uh, map usually one end correctly, and the other are break into pieces. And you take that to uh, different uh, to uh, do the, the calling of the variants. So what are the signatures that you can observe with speed read? So here uh, it's the paired end mapping, so what we see in the, in the previous uh, methods. So if you have a deletion, you expect to see a, 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 a larger uh, indel, but you expect also to have a read that in your donor is like that, is, is one sequence, but in your reference, the first part of the read will map to the genomes, and you will have a break, and the second part will map and, uh, later on to the genome. For insertion, we, ex we expect to see in paired and mapping to have, uh, in read pair, to have the uh, insert size which is shorter, and in as a uh, split read, in the split read, uh, in the split read, you expect to have so one part of the read that is mapped, one part that is deleted, and, and the third part that is mapped to the, close to the first one. So it's where you see here, for that kind of signature, that the longest your read will be, the easiest uh, the method will be able to detect this kind of event. And it will also give you a more resolution to take larger insertion. You know, uh, then when you do uh, inversion, you will have the signature for the pattern mapping. So we'll have, you will have the inversion where your reads are large insertion and inverted. And one is inverted. Here, you will be able to see reads that map, uh, a cluster of reads that map at, at one end and that are uh, inverted, the read position in the, in the other, and the second breakpoint. Uh, so as you can see in that, uh, in, in that uh, presentation for the speech read, I always compare, show you speech read versus paired and mapping. So because now the tool, the new tools, uh, is a way to, to analyze the data is to mix both signals. That's how the, the new tools are working. So it's important to not only use speech read, but to use speech read and paired and mapping at the same time. Uh, because uh, if you do speech read, give you also a lot of false positive, but not the same as what you have in read pair. And it's really slow. So a lot of the tools will go first with read pair and then add the speech read on, on the uh, on a, as an additional layer to confirm the, the method. The advantage is uh, you can have better detection and have the breakpoint detection at the same time. So the split read tools is this one. And you see, oh, we have the same daily, which is a tool that do split read and pattern mapping. It's why we will. Uh, use this uh, tool. Another really good tool to do it is uh, LMP that do both of the um, of the of the techniques. So the summary of uh, the uh, speed read uh, strength and weakness. So in terms of strength, uh, it works really well in, uh, uh, in pair with the read the pair methods. It gives you best pair resolution. And it can detect the really short insertion that the, that the, um, you cannot have the resolution to to detect in the in paired and mapping. So if you if you um, if you uh, have really short insertion or deletion with pair, you will be under the standard deviation. So it can give you a better resolution. 
weakness, a lot more, it need more coverage than what you have in the read pair, and uh, there's a lot of uh, false positive. Third method is the read depth. So the read depth is mainly used to detect insertion deletion. It's uh, the traditional method to detect so copy number variation. Uh, so uh, how it works? Uh, it's based on a, on a, on a assumption that you have an homogeneous distribution of your read along the genome, and if you have a, a copy number variation. If it's a deletion, you will have a decrease in, uh, in the amount of read you will see at the position. And if you have an amplification, you will you will have uh, no. If you have an amplification, you have an increase. If you have a deletion, you have a decrease. So it works really well, except that we this assumption is not always true. So how it works? You divide your genome into a bin of equal size, so you can choose your bin. It will really this cho this choice will have an impact on the resolution but also an impact of the noise and the false positive. Uh, then you estimate the depth of coverage in each bin. And then you look for a cluster of consecutive bins that show you either the um, significant excess or loss of, loss of coverage. So it's where we, uh, the NGS meets the um, methods of uh, CGHRA, which are the measure of depth, and you, and you do exactly the same. You do you do um, segmentation of your genomes, and then you, you look at uh, the variation of, uh, of coverage. So how it works, you have your genome. If you have a, a deletion, you expect to see so no, almost no reads. If you, are, uh, if you have amplification, you, excess, you, you see excess of reads. In terms of what you see in IGV, when you have a good event in a in in normal sample, uh, SNV is really clear. You can see that you cl clearly see you have a, your general mean coverage and you have this excess of, of uh, DNA. So it works really well, really well. What you need to do is to correct for GC because you have a GC bias of sequencing and uh, use uh, any uh, segmentation tools like we do with CJSRA. So just to give you an example, so this is a cancer sample. We use it on cancer. Here's a tool that I've developed which is called scones. So you have the, your cancer genome, your normal genomes, and you ju just do the ratio of the bin, and you plot, and you see it's really in case where it works well, because in cancer it's really often that it's not working well. The um, the patterns are really evident to call. When it's but here, as you can see, when we look at the data, what we tend to do is to look. I got my genome, I got my point, and I try to look at points that are different from the rest of the genomes. That's uh, a major weakness of this method. It's because it's how you normalize your data. So, so most of the data makes the assumption, as I say, that you have homogeneous coverage. So this is what you expect as a signal of uh, of copy number variation. You, ex you expect your genome will have a constant homogeneous coverage, and then you have a region with an, with an excess of uh, coverage for an amplification. Now, imagine you have this point, it is really an amplification, but instead of having this homogeneous coverage, you have this coverage. Trying to find that this is uh, an amplification, become really, really more tricky. It's because we are not, we are not as I say, we don't have the, the assumption that is, um, that is almost homogeneous all over the genomes. Several ways to uh, avoid facing this uh, result, taking large OSBIN. If you take large OSBIN, you will normalize the coverage you, you, you measure. But you will lose some resolution. So there's another method that have been developed in the, in the lab. Uh, of the um, at uh, C3G, which work fantastically to uh, avoid that. In one condition, to have another sample. So the idea of this method, which will pop as well, it, it's instead of normalizing your count over the bin, your neighbor bins, you take a population of sample and you normalize vertically. So you're, ga you're looking for this particular bin in several set of samples in a 
10, 30, 20, 100 samples? What are the variations of coverage for this bin in all the samples? So you've got the local variation and the distribution into your set of control samples. And in red, you've got the distribution in your sample. And then you are able to um, uh, take into account this local and uh, non-homogeneous distribution of the bits. So if you have enough read, I would say that this method beat my method for sure. If you have enough sample to enough sample to to work on on that, yeah. What's the like a minimum number you would think for that to be valid? A valid. <laughs> That's a tricky question. I, I, it's a it's a PhD student that developed this method in the lab, and I still say you need to assess the real num the minimal number, and we don't have a, a minimal number, but from experiment up to 10 to 15, we're starting to have really good results. Uh, especially in a low mappable region and in a repeated region. You said that the, so if you don't go with this method, one of the main problems is the bin size. If you have the right bin size, it's going to work better, but you might miss some information. So, so if, if you do some kernel density estimation, it does with an automatic estimation of your kernel size, mm -hmm. does it improve the results? Yeah, it could. Uh, but the thing is, there's really like local variation. If you look at the coverage, if you, I see the, the images of the, of the duplication, you see in a, like in every 10 bases, the coverage could be fairly. So the kernel will probably have trouble to find uh, the, the right yeah. And then the because it's, uh, local some region will have lots of variation, some other not. Because you could have a local a local estimation of your kernel yeah. size. Might improve also. Yeah, probably. Write your tools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, do you have to use something like hyperploidy? In uh, hyperploidy, uh, usually, so hyperploidy is more main, you mainly cancer, or you talk about hyperploid um, organism. So in cancer, usually, uh, what we do, we estimate the ploidy generally before running uh, tool for CMD. So you have to use a Yeah, like we use a tool like Sequenza or, uh, or uh, uh, Battenberg, that it, we estimate. They look at how the variation in the, the beta line frequency of the read in the ploidy gated region to estimate the, the frequency of the, ploidy, uh, to the purity and the ploidy of the sample. And then we use that to, uh, as a parameter in the copy number uh, analysis. <coughs> yeah? And for your validation set, does it have to be done like library prep in the same way, the same sequence machine, exactly? Like everything has the exact same parameters as far as the sequencing so that any variation from the sequencing is not. So you yeah. can just pull available genomes off. Yeah. So you need to have homogeneous control as, as usual. Otherwise, you will, it will work from a lot of bins. But some means will be like uh, crazy. So the different tools, so many, many tools. Uh, not so many tools that are dedicated to cancer. Uh, and most of them do a good job. So most of them do a good job in, no in a normal population. It's where you go to cancer and repeated regions that it starts to be um, difficult. So the summary of the uh, read depth approach. So it's a relatively low uh, resolution. Uh, the breakpoints are ambiguous because you can, your breakpoint will fall in a bin. So you know that your breakpoint will be approximately in that range of bins. So you will have, a, depending on what the size of the bin, it could be uh, a K, uh, if you have a one KB bin, you know that your breakpoint is a one is a one KB region. So it's not easy to detect exactly the breakpoint. And you cannot detect balanced rearrangement. The strength, fast and simple, it's really easy to interpret. As I saw you the graph, when you, when you look at the graph, you can, uh, you, you can really say, OK, I've got a uh, there there and there. And there's a lot of met some methods, not a lot, some methods that do like machine learning in normal to do that. It works well in normal, it don't work in cancer. Because the problem of cancer, each sample is specific. Each sample has its own purity, its own, cellular, its own cellularity, and everything. Um, so uh, the strength, it determines the copy number. 
so it really tell you can really tell you how many copy you have uh, and with new methods you can have also information in the repeated region and low coverage region the last uh, approach you can use to do uh, SV uh, structural variant detection is uh, assembly so uh, the idea of the assembly, you have your genomes, you don't care about your genome, you take your reads and you reassemble them. You will see this afternoon how it works to do the assembly. The idea is to, to create a new reference specific to your, um, to your uh, sample. Then you take this long context and then you map this context to the reference. And you see, oh my, I got one context in one pieces and it's breaking a few pieces. So you know that you have deleted the region. So the idea is really uh, simple and efficient uh, because it gives you really large sequence, large fragments that are uh, easier to, to match. Uh, and there are two different approaches. The one is to do a world genome assembly, and the other is to do local assembly. So world genome assembly works better, <coughs> but it's in terms of um, computing, is really intensive. Uh, to compute uh, uh, a world genome assembly for a human. So just to tell you, uh, for example, uh, at BC, they do a how they detect their structural variants, they use a world genome assembly, but they have only they have a cluster that is only dedicated to that. So they have 3,000 CPUs only dedicated to do world genome assembly of human. So you need to have a lot of resources to, to do that. So it's why this local assembly approach has been developed. So how the world genome approach works. As I say, you do your world genome the sequence assembly, and then you compare. You do BLAT, you group your scaffold and the same chromosome, and you look at how it's aligned. Uh, so it's really well because it's really, it really takes, uh, bring you everything that is de novo. Uh, where, how the local de novo assembly works. The idea is you do your mapping here, and you will have different, so if you have, a, for example, an insertion here, you will have the reads from, the, from your, that are in your, uh, the fragments that are come from your insertion that won't map. So it's what we call the orphan. So it's the two paired unmapped. Then you will have, so uh, the read here in, in red, in green, which, are, which is called OEA, which is mean uh, one end anchored. So that means that this read have one read that map correctly, and the other read don't map. So you take this read, this two set of read, orphan OEA, and you re do reassemble. You do the reassembly on this uh, subset of read. So you really reduce what you need to assemble. So you really, really reduce your compute uh, needs to do that. And then you have your context. And what to do? You take your context, you take the OEA that should be at the, at the, at the uh, end part of your context, and you look where this OEA encore with the, with the read that you map in the genomes. And that tells you where the sequence and the new SV is located in your, in your reference. So it's kind of signature you, you will see, and it's, it's, work, it's work well. It's, more, it's, it's also intensive in terms of compute, but it's work well. And there's a new tool that did that really well for the local assembly. Ah, I didn't update my slide because I found it like one week ago. Uh, ah, I will I will look in my notes. But there's a new tool that worked really well to do this local assembly. Here's a de novo, typical de novo assembler, assembler you can use to do uh, the assembly. Uh, so the tool is not there. So Cortex, SGA, Discover. Uh, Abyss, Ray, and so on. So what are the strengths and the weakness of these methods? Uh, so weakness, computational, computationally very intensive, so especially for world genome uh, assembly. And sometimes it could be hard to resolve your, uh, the result of your BLAST. If you are in repeated region, you will have your, your, your context that could map different uh, regions, so you don't know exactly what is uh, the, the region. The strengths, you could have best pair resolution of your breakpoint, and you can detect every type of SV.
So just to give you a summary of the methods. So you've got the depth of coverage, but the mapping split treat and the assembly. So it's the resolution you could have. So either you can have the speed treat and mapping have the uh, higher resolution, but the uh, higher dif difficulty and cost to do to do it. So it's always a balance to do to choose. A summary of the of uh, the SV methods. So you have four methods that exist. Either has its own strength and uh, weakness. So if you are interested in a one specific type of uh, structural variant, you could adapt and choose the, the, the method that uh, fits your data. The most recent tool now combine uh, several methods. So Dumpy and Delhi, I really recommend you to use this tool. And the major challenge to when we do SV is to uh, uh, understand complex events, because you will have several set of calls that will be in the same region. And to really understand what, what you have, it's sometimes really, really hard. And you cannot really resolve that. To really find the breakpoint, because when you find the breakpoint, if you want to validate your data, you need to have the real breakpoint to like design kind of PCR or all this kind of, of, of thing. Uh, now, in terms of what you could expect to see in IGV, so this is the type of deletion. I see we saw it one uh, yesterday. This is what we saw in terms of uh, duplication. So, so it's a tandem duplication, as we saw the, the, the read are inverted and, and with large uh, inter size and excess of coverage. This is what we saw for an inversion. So you have two clusters of reads that cluster together. This one and this one. And and these two other. So this is uh, your uh, in insertion. So you've got this read, some of the reads that map there, and you've got all this uh, new uh, new distance, new, new call. And what is a typically view that we do for um, structural variant is the circus plot. So usually you have different tracks that tell you the point of your of your different point of each uh, event, and you've got the uh, translocation of your genome. So if you do cancer, you will probably have seen this uh, time several times. So circus is really good tool to represent your SV. Uh, but if you use the real circos uh, tools, it gives you really high, uh, a really uh, high quality graph, but it's, it's a, a bit complicated to use. Uh, there's no new um, solution to do that with uh, R, uh, with some package like Circleize or, or, um, or circos, R circos to, to generate this, this kind of graph, which is way more easy to do and way more oriented to genomics. That's it. Do you have any question? Does this tool work with the targeted data? Um, most of them could work with targeted data, um, except the recaps tool. Uh, but not for PSV, for PSV would work. Because the problem with targeted data and the read depths is um, your coverage uh, in targeted data in the example, for example, sequencing, is uh, linked to how many bits you have, how many props you have. So the way the, the way, oh, can, I, can I go here? So you've got your, your exam like that. And how, how you do the targeted? You do some you do some probes that catch this region. Okay. And some exon will have a lot of probes, some other really few. So you cannot so all the methods that normalize horizontally in the same sample will be biased by the by the number of, of uh, probes you have in each exon. To uh, character to uh, catch this uh, this sequence, so it it won't work. 
So some new tools are, are, being tested, are being developed to try to take that into account, but it's not working so well. It's why when you have exons, it's better to use a more population approach, like ProtestV or uh, there's another tool. Uh, try to remember uh, the name of the tool. I think it's it's I've got there. So uh, which one it is? Uh, no, not there. So there's another tool, I don't remember the name, that is doing also kind of population uh, approach. So in exam, it's better to localize, to normalize vertically your your, uh, your read depth, because every sample for this exam has the same number of, uh, of uh, probes that have been used. Do you mind uh, explaining the rationale for split reading? For split So you take your reads, you look at the reads which have one read that are match normally, and the other which have been cut in two pieces. So you will have one part which is called primary alignment, and the other will be secondary alignment. And then you look how so where the secondary alignment is in the reference or in the sample. So it will be it will be marked in the background. You will have the reads that have cut in three, in two, three, four pieces. Okay. The longest one will be the primary alignment, the longest and the, and the, and the best one, and the other will be secondary. So it's just the way it's called. Okay. And you look where the secondary alignments are positioned uh, regarding to the first one. If you are positioned at another location, probably you have distance location. If you are positioned at a distance of x number of base pair, you probably have lost the sequence between the primary and the secondary. Oh, okay. So why do you need more than a split of two? Why do you need more than a split of two? It doesn't matter. Of course, we usually it's one, it's a two or three. And uh, the, 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 as I said, the, what you do, not for one read, but you try to look cluster of reads that show you the same pattern of of read split in, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the same location. So if you look closer of read, you have the same primary. So primary could be at the two, at the two uh, breakpoint of your, uh, the if the breakpoint arrive at a different location, if you read, the primary could be that one or that one. Okay. So you, you, you just look like the link between a primary and a secondary uh, read, and the cluster of read that show at the same location, the same jump. Okay. Mm -hmm.